Hello, I'm Cassandra Eve of Pole Woman, and I'm here today to talk with Joy Harvey of the Resilience Room in the fourth of my Conscious Conversation series. And today we're speaking about Ceres, who's also known as Demeter, who is the Earth Mother archetype. Now, Joy's uh, creative business, her offering is called the Resilience Room. And she has a big vision for this project. So uh, I'd like to welcome you, Joy, and perhaps you'd start by sharing with us what that vision is. Hello, Cassandra, lovely to see you again. Yes, the Resilience Room um, was birthed literally um, last year during lockdown, as I began to recollect my experiences during life of how I've overcome issues and particularly uh, my specific focus is working with birth mothers of adoptees, which kind of gives everybody the, the, my background that as a young 16 year old, I, I had to give my child out, my, my newborn uh, for adoption and how that affected me during my life. And over the past decade or so, I've gathered the skills together to support me. And I now want to share those skills with other women who've gone through very similar experiences. I won't say the same, we've, we've all had slightly var slight variations on our experiences, but to support those women um, to move away from the desolate feeling of emptiness, of loss, and, um, and step into being them without the loss, but acknowledging that they did experience loss. Mm. That's wonderful. And the journey of series, as we'll discover, is about that resilience that uh, we need or we do discover, perhaps, through moving through a whole cycle that includes loss. So I want to start by sharing a little bit about who she is, what the archetype is, and all the archetypes come from Greek or uh, Roman mythology, but they're rooted in much more ancient cultures, particularly in the Middle and the Near East. And Ceres is also known as Demeter. And her mythology, uh, traditionally, she was known as the goddess of the harvest. So she was the one who looked after the sowing and the planting and the nurturing and the bringing to harvest of the food. But she also represents so much more than that, because through her myth, which I'm going to share with you in a moment, we discover how that was only kind of partial. And um, if we look at our culture today, we can also see how our view of life can be partial. We're kind of denying the autumn and winter of life, the time of rest and replenishment and slowing down. That's something that we've had to look at more through experiences over the last 18 months or so. So Ceres myth also shows us how we, in full health, we, we move through a full cycle well. And of course that requires resilience. And then she's also connected to the mysteries of women's fertility and our connection to the seasons of the earth, our connections to nature, through our own cycles. So the myth, and it's interesting that the myth, the Roman and myths, Roman and Greek myths have different names for these archetypes. And in astrology, they're mixed. So some are Greek, some are Roman. So when I share the myths, sometimes I'm using the Greek name, sometimes I'm giving the Roman name because, you know, my, my basis of my knowledge and understanding is through astrology into the mythology rather than the other way around. So those of you who are pure mythologists, if there's such a word, forgive me in that. So Ceres and her daughter Persephone were in the garden of the gods. So we might consider that to be like the garden of Eden. So they were, they were happy there was no hardship. They were in that sowing, planting, reaping aspect of the garden, the abundance, the fertility of the garden. 
But Persephone was entering a place of maturity. And in some versions of the myth, uh, it's said that Ceres, her mother, was turning away potential partners. But nonetheless, Persephone was entering that place where she was ready. One day they were in the garden together, enmeshed. They're very much in oneness. And Persephone wanders off because she spies a new flower that she's not seen before. In the myth, it was the Narcissus, you know, that flower of spring. So she wanders off from her mother. And as she does so, Pluto, otherwise known as Hades, Lord of the Underworld, comes out of this split in the earth in his black chariot with his six black horses. And there are two versions of the myth here. One is that Persephone shrieks, but then chooses to go with him, him into the underworld. The other is that she's abducted. And this is not uncommon in these myths because this is a time of patriarchy when patriarchy was um, controlling and overtaking what had previously been a, a goddess-based culture. So Persephone disappears because she gets in the chariot or she's pulled into the chariot. The earth closes over, no trace of her. Ceres realizes something is amiss, but she doesn't know what. When Persephone shrieks, the goddess Hecate, who's the crone, hears her shriek and she notes it, but she doesn't do anything about it at that point. So many symbols in this mythology. So Ceres realizes that her daughter's missing. Over time, she wanders the earth looking for her daughter, but can find her nowhere. She's in grief. There are various kind of sidelines to the myth that I won't go into now, but basically she is being taken into the loss so part of the cycle through her grieving of her daughter. Meanwhile, Persephone in the underworld is getting on very well with Pluto and becomes his consort, his wife, his queen. Nonetheless, she misses her mother. Eventually, they are reunited through a long series of different events that involves the crone, Hecate, the sun god Apollo, Zeus and Pluto, who have plotted this abduction or separation between Ceres and her daughter. So eventually they're reunited. But before Persephone leaves the underworld, she's invited by Pluto to eat the seeds of the pomegranate. And the seeds of the pomegranate ensure that she returns to the underworld as queen. So the, you know, the result of the story is that she moves between the underworld and the, and the garden. When she comes back into the garden, spring comes. When she moves back into the underworld, autumn comes. And the cycle is complete, just as the cycles of the seasons. So I'm just gonna read a little piece from my book sacred pathways to expand on that. And then um, I'm going to invite Joy to share some of her experiences on this theme. So series message, life is change. When we flow with each season, we grow. Ceres as ancient goddess of the grain and the harvest represents the natural cycles of growth and abundance. Yet her mythology reveals a fact that is always present. The only certainty in life is that everything changes. Ceres and Persephone in the garden were happy, one might even say blissful. They were blissfully ignorant of their need for growth, perhaps. Some myth states that Ceres was turning away suitors for Persephone's hand in marriage, yet change was inevitable. They were powerless to stop it. Persephone wandered off from her mother. The new flower she saw was calling her. It represented the dawn of new experience. Persephone was ripe for change. Perhaps she had the growing yearning for something new, 
but was not conscious of it until Pluto appeared. She was the maiden ready for womanhood. Pluto and her father Zeus's plotting came at the right time. Pluto's appearance as the agent of change was evolution at work, whether Persephone went willingly or not. The next stage of maturity was upon her and arriving for her mother too. Just like Ceres and Persephone, we cannot avoid life's tides. The darkness is one with the light. The cycle is eternally moving and our challenge perhaps is to move with it. Change is unavoidable. Ceres, as a relationship goddess, was not made to stand alone. Her gifts were to nurture, to care, to sustain and to cultivate the harvest. Yet life brought her change and growth, as it does us all at times. As guardian of life, how could Ceres not know death's sting and coldness too? In her aloneness and grieving of what was lost, the seed of new life was planted. It would bear a deeper, sweeter harvest, grown through pain as well as love. It was the completion of the whole cycle. Ceres mythology shows us how we move through the entirety of a life cycle or a process. Life and death, love and loss, pain and growth walking hand in hand. She reveals the gifts we may receive in what may feel like devastation. She reveals the mystery of life's eternal process to renewal. So, Joy, you know, we've spoken about how your life and your work reflects the journey with loss and grief. Mm -hmm. So can you tell me about that very briefly mentioned one lost your experience, but I know there was one prior to that. And can you briefly share what that was and how it affected you, how perhaps it was dealt with or not dealt with mm. as part of this legacy of change that you've been speaking about? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, my father's youngest sister was only 12, 13 years older than I, and we were incredibly close. And um, she took her own life in her early 20s. Um, she was um, recently married and the marriage, her husband left her uh, after about three months and she, she couldn't cope. And rather than reaching out and seeming to be perceived as a failure, she took her own life. And that came as a huge shock. That came as a, as a massive shock for me. And I instinctively went to her mum, my nan. Um, I had time off school. I just, uh, there was no way I was going to focus on any schooling and the school agreed. So I just went to stay with nan for a few days. It, it left a huge vacancy and gap in, within me um, because she had been not a confidant, but she had been my role model, my mentor. Um, vibrant, vibrant redhead that she was. And so it was handled really well um, from my perspective. I remember, I remember my father taking the phone call the night before we were told. And I remember him saying um, to, I guess it was the police on the other end, no, don't go up to see them because they're elderly and they live alone on a farm. It won't make any difference. That won't bring her back. I'll go up tomorrow and tell them in the daytime. And having once I was told and I connected the dots and I put that together and I realised that my dad was thinking of his parents even during his great loss and I too instinctively, instinctively wanted to go to her parents, my dad's parents, um, because I'd grown up with them from the age of one until I was eight um, and at the time I was still getting up and running up to the farm every morning before school I was very very close to them so I wanted to go there yes her her passing was dealt with quite well from my nan's perspective grandpa couldn't cope with the fact that she'd taken her own life and so didn't speak about her ever again but slowly but surely the rest of the family 
we do we do mm. Mm. and um, yes with with some of the the, the skills that i now have it, it's it's eased the the gap within me the the rawness and i you know i talk about her and i smile it's a very very special memory um suicide is never easy to 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 get to come to terms with because those of us who are left are constantly asking why and could i have done something more and yeah that yeah. can set up a whole series of am i good enough was i good enough questions in our own minds and i know that as a 10 year old i did everything i possibly could because i wasn't aware of how how deeply she was hurting mm. yeah absolutely i mean tragic and in many ways looking at it from the different the other perspective than i was sharing in the myth of series because the myth speaks about series grief at losing her daughter but not about her daughter's process of um moving through that loss of you know union with the mother or union with that that kind of sister bond which i'm hearing you mm. describe that you had with your your aunt like a, a sister mother you know big sister kind of energy my um, mum described it she said oh dear she said you've lost your best pal oh mm. and she was right she um judy was 12 13 years older than me uh, which was exactly the same difference as between Judy and my dad, who was the eldest of their eight um, siblings. So, in fact, I could have easily, not physically, but I was sort of the eldest of the grandchildren and I almost became my nan's ninth child. Yeah. Put me under her wing. And so there was no difference. Um, my aunts and uncles were very close in age and I just tagged on the end of them. Mm -hmm. I don't believe I was ever really seen as a, as a niece. I was just, um, oh yeah, and, and joy. It was yeah, the eight of us and joy. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that any of my other cousins had that because I was literally with, with, with my nan every day for the first six, seven years of my life. Mm -hmm. So wonderful in that, um, you know, you had that support to help you through that, that terrible loss. And particularly at a time when age 10, you know, a young girl is coming into puberty as, as well, which in itself is a time of loss. And we will look at that later in our, in our, our chat. So I do, I do remember, um, oh, I think it was Boxing Day that year. And Christmas was really strange because she took her life um, the 10th or the 11th of December so it was it, it was all very very difficult but I did go in to um, to see my nan and, and my other two aunts and they said and how are you and I said well I saw Judy last night did you and what did she say to you wow and that was so liberating nobody said oh don't be silly it must have been a dream they completely accepted what I was telling them and how powerful in terms of affirming your experience so that later when you went into the experience of having to having your baby adopted and we'll share about that in a moment you had the strength to do what you did mm. so would you, would you share more about that you know what happened in terms of what you were sharing with me earlier today in terms of the process of um, being a young woman who's pregnant and having to face and take responsibility for that, actually. Yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Responsibility used to be my middle name. Um, I, I felt pregnant. And as soon as I realised I was pregnant, I, I had two choices. I could speak up and I felt that the the baby wouldn't wouldn't see fruition um or i could say nothing 
and my decision was that this baby deserved to live. This baby had done nothing wrong. I had done nothing wrong. It was one of those things. And if Mother Nature had decided I was having a baby, then I was having a baby. The child's father was going off on a, on a career that he dreamed of, and I didn't want to get in the way of that. I didn't want to prevent him from, from exploring his dreams. It was a lovely chap, but not the one for me. And so I made that decision as well, that I wouldn't tell anybody. For, so my parents discovered in a roundabout way when I was five and a half months pregnant. And I was the eldest of four. Uh, Mum and dad didn't have a huge amount of money. And so the decision was made that I would go away. I would just be sent away somewhere. And it, it, was, it was very difficult for everybody involved, very, very difficult. Eventually social services came into, into our lives and there was a mother and baby home in North Wales. And I went there in April, 1979. And it was a shock. It was a completely different environment. Um, women in the same situation as me, some of them wanted to keep their babies. Some of them couldn't for a variety of reasons. Um, and it's one of those experiences where you get very close to people, but you know it's only for a very short amount of time. And that if you ever see them again in the street, you probably won't speak because the people with them wouldn't understand or may not even know. And that's it. That's the, it's the start of the big conspiracy. We all have a secret and we all know each other's secret, but we can't speak about it publicly. So I was, I was in a mother and baby home in North Wales and it was run by nuns and we were treated beautifully. I'm, I, if I'm the only one that ever says that, we were treated so well. Um, the midwife, Sister Celine, they were the Sisters of Nazareth. And Sister Celine was just marvellous. She was not much older than, well, she was, she was in her 20s. She was a little bit older than us. But she would come in on a Thursday and say, come on girls, you've got to get up. You've got to dance to Top of the Pops. You know, you've got to oil your pelvis because it's not going to be easy for you. There was no, there was no sort of fluffing around that, oh yes, you're going to have a baby, how beautiful. No, it's going to hurt girls, but it won't last forever. Um, my, she induced my labour the old fashioned way, and I won't go into details. She um, then examined me and realized that it was a breech birth. It was a breech baby it was presenting. And she wasn't allowed to deliver breech babies at the home. She was a fully qualified midwife. Ordinarily, uh, girls delivered their babies at the home in a very gentle, loving environment. It was marvelous. I wasn't, I had a blue lights and sirens ride to hospital on my own, uh, three months short of being 17 and then went into this hostile environment and I wasn't treated well. I wasn't treated well at all. Um, I, it was a very, very difficult, um, my son was a large baby. Uh, he was eight, 12 when he was born, eight pounds, 12. I don't know what that translates to in, in modern, in, um, but yeah, eight pound 12. And eventually it was decided I needed an emergency C-section. So I signed the papers and, and off I was wheeled, uh, general anaesthetic. So I wasn't aware, I didn't see him. Um, it took me a long time to come around from surgery. It was a good eight hours before I came around. And even then there were, I was being monitored as an emergency. The next day when I eventually woke and I was conscious and the door opened in the afternoon and my social worker popped her head in. And at that point, I really didn't know whether I had a boy or a girl. Nobody took the time to point out that on my wrist was a, was a little tag telling me I'd got a boy. Um, so I didn't know. And anyway, my social worker was there and I just said, oh, hello. Didn't expect to see you here today. She, as glib as you like, she just said, oh, well, when, when babies are born in hospital, we just take them straight to foster. And the realization dawned on me, they were going to take him without me ever having seen him. And I said, no. And she sort of looked a bit surprised. And I said, no, had I given birth at the home, I would have had two weeks to pour a lifetime's worth of love into this baby. If I, if I have nowhere to go, 
I have no network of, of support. I have no skills or qualifications because I was expelled from school. I want more for this baby than I had myself. I don't have a choice. I have to give him up for it. I have to give the child up for adoption. You can't take him. That is not in our agreement. I haven't signed anything that you can take him. You cannot take him. And I don't know where that strength came from. I, I glibly say that, you know, it's my seven foot five breathing dragon mother in me. But it was, I, there was something more primal. I needed this baby to know that he was loved. I needed this baby to experience my love for him before he was taken elsewhere. And he wasn't going to get my love from anybody else but me. And so I fought my corner and I won. And I understand that when the social worker got back to her office, she rang, and my mother told me this years later, and she rang and she said, gosh, Joy's strong-minded, isn't she? Mum said, yes. Yes, I could have told you that a long time ago. Yes, she is. If Joy says something, yes. And if Joy has agreed, this baby is going for adoption, then this baby will be going for adoption. If that's what Joy says, then that's what Joy will do. But yeah, if Joy wants to look after him for two weeks, then you give her that. And it was beautiful. He was such a lovely baby to look after. Hospital was horrible. He didn't like it in hospital. I didn't like it in hospital. I wasn't allowed to have him by my side. Nobody was in those days. All, all new mums were treated appallingly. Um, he was brought to my side when he needed feeding and at visiting times, like I was going to have visitors. But, and I remember one day he was hungry during visiting times and, no, and he was crying and nobody came. None of the nursing staff came to me to say, oh, come on, if he's hungry, let's, let's, because you haven't got any visitors. There was no kindness in the hospital. And I, always talking to somebody last night and that could be generic right across maternity wards of that era it possibly wasn't just me but it happened to me that nobody came to support me to say why don't we take him and feed him would you like me to go and get some food i came within a whisker of feeding him myself and i knew once i did that he was not going nowhere and i wanted to ensure that this baby had a better life growing up than I had had. You know, I needed him to have extended family and I couldn't offer him that at the time. Profound, you know, so, so, so deeply moving. And there are a few things I was seeing through that, through that relating of your experience. And thank you for that, because it, is, it touches so deeply in terms of woman's experience yeah and I remember being told off in um you know inverted commas but that's how it felt as a mm. new mum yeah for for picking up my baby and holding him mm. you know oh you'll make a rod for your own back dear if you do that mm. you know just for loving for being in that that mm. amazing place and what I was hearing in you is this incredible strength for a 16 year old girl mm -hmm. to actually, you know, say, no, you're not mm -hmm. taking him. I will give him up, but you're not mm -hmm. taking him mm -hmm. yet. You know, give me that space. Mm -hmm. And how I was seeing a link in that in terms of the loss you experienced with your aunt and how what you knew uh, was supported at that time and how as children you know when we are affirmed in our own experience it does give us the strength then to face the changes that that life brings us because we've been held in our in our experience no matter how weird or wild or wonderful it is you know it's been supported as your truth mm -hmm. So there was the inner strength in you, but also that that had been held and, and supported through an experience of loss before. And maybe there's a link between, you know, that loss being so sudden and you not being able to say goodbye or perhaps the things that you may have needed to say. Mm -hmm. And knowing that you needed the time with your child before that, that moment came. Mm 
to to give as much as you could and that this is so deeply so deeply moving so what happened for you in terms of once the adoption was in process did the experience and this is you know for me it's like it's a kind of strange question but it's there did you feel that that experience was complete because although you'd only been with him for a couple of weeks you were able to give all the love that you had at that point to this child to give him a new beginning do you feel that that was complete at that point no 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 i ached physically and emotionally for him mm. for years and years and years um one of the things that um, my family said, um, my parents said, was that having told me I wasn't allowed back home, which was fundamental to the decision to, to give him up for adoption, I didn't really have a choice. If you agree to join up, because I had shown an interest in, in the armed forces, uh, back in the days, girls didn't do guns or assault courses or anything like that. Um, I had shown an interest. So if you agree to join up, you can come home. So I did. Because where else would I go? And so I joined an organisation that housed me, fed me, trained me, helped me see the world. I did lots of things. But during my basic training, and I suppressed every emotion about my son that I possibly could. Mm. And during my basic training, which was around about his first birthday, one evening my breasts just leaked milk. And there was a couple of girls around me and they said, oh, Joy, your T-shirt's wet. And I looked down, I was like, oh, oh. Well, of course, nowhere on the camp sold breast pads it was a long long time since I'd needed them and um, so I had to fashion something um, out of um, toilet roll probably but yes that was my body just reminding me mm. look girly you are a mum you mm. are a mum even if you can't say it mm. and yeah. that was that was life for 40 40 something years that I I I devised an answer to the question, have you never wanted children? Because my body wouldn't carry another pregnancy. Mm. I had a couple of miscarriages, but my body would never carry another pregnancy full term. It, it just said, no, I'm not going through that again. The trauma was embedded. Um, so, yes, it, it, I, I devised this answer that when people say, oh, have you never wanted children or have you got any children? I so said, I've never been able to raise my own. I've never raised my own family. Wow. It was very specific because I could not and would not deny his existence. Mm. I could not. Somehow I knew that out there, there was a connection that other people couldn't see. And there was no way I was going to break it. I was not going to cut those ties. The ties and the door were always open. Mm yeah and profound to to witness that visceral response of your body mm. to its own memory yes yeah 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 uh, how profound yes. yeah yeah and you know you mentioned the fact that you suppressed the loss you know and i know and i'm sure you do too through the wisdom of you know, mature experience, that at times we need to do that because we don't have the capacity to face it fully. Mm -hmm. We have to maybe wait until we do have more capacity to process and to heal such a profound loss, if it is ever healed. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. sometimes it's simply that we learn to live with loss. Yes. Rather than resolve or heal it or fix it, which is our kind of cultural 
view on it move on you know get on with life or however it is um, mm. we're always told to stop shaking if we're in a shock oh stop shaking stop shaking no actually shake it out otherwise the body will hold on to it absolutely yeah absolutely so we're going to move more now into looking at i want to thank you and honor you first for sharing that yeah so beautifully so truthfully and so movingly so thank you for that thank you. um and moving on to look at series connection to our bodies as women and how as women we are the whole cycle that includes that loss so if you just think about menstruation you know it's the full cycle that either comes to fruition through a child or moves into loss through menstruation so we hold that wholeness in our wounds and the potential of both loss and birth mm. yeah and how many women are taught that you know this is where menstrual education is so important nowadays and thankfully changing so i'm going to read a little bit more from my book to introduce that the mystery of the female cycles reflects the pulse of life's natural cycles they reveal the unity of the processes of life within women and the earth each is a mirror the ebb and flow of the tides the cycling of the moon, the pulse of night and day and the rhythm of the seasons. All is emerging, expressing, coming to fullness and completion only to begin again. Our lives as female reveal the innate rhythmic connection that we have with nature. Traditionally, the moon is seen as the guardian of women's menstrual cycle. Her cycle of waxing and waning to and from fullness connects intrinsically with our body's menstrual rhythm. As the moon rules the tides of the ocean, she carries the tides of women's blood. Yet here we meet the feminine nature of cycles within cycles, rhythms within rhythms, tides within tides. The moon tides align in the same flow as the seasons carrying the potential of life and its harvest, then its passing and renewal. Ceres is the same, yet has one difference. Although primarily her energy holds the space of pregnancy and mothering, her cycle is evolutionary. It opens a new spiral of growth. Her cycle is going somewhere rather than cycling around in the same rhythm. Ceres opens and expands from the moon cycle when there are evolutionary shifts for women within its flow. Menarche, a girl's first menstru menstruation, is the opening of the natural unity of the moon and Ceres. It is the doorway to women's role as creatrix of physical life. Menarche is an emergence it's the promise of womanhood and the potential of becoming a mother. Yet Menarch is a loss too. It's the loss of innocence. If not held well in its awesome mystery, it's the opening to the shadows of woman too. To shame about our body and its functions. To what might be seen as the inconvenience of the curse in inverted commas. Resistance to the shedding that occurs at Menarche reveals to us how collectively we have moved away from the letting go aspect of the natural cycle. It shows us how disconnected we have become from our bodies, the earth and her cycles. So we can see, you know, within that kind of the wheels, within the wheels, within the wheels, within the wheels, the rhythms, within the rhythm, rhythms, how our lives reflect, particularly as women, we reflect that cyclical nature of the moon and the earth and how without those seasons of autumn and winter, the letting go and the potential for rest and quiet and replenishment, you know, we, we come to spring depleted if we don't embrace autumn and winter. 
and you know hopefully we're beginning to understand this now on a really visceral level collectively given what our collective experience has been over the last 18 months mm -hmm. now when we relate particularly to series and this is um part of my work with whole woman and your work and your vision with the resilience room is is understanding those um places within the cycle because we have the cycle and the rhythms but we also have different stages within that cycle or different states of being and series particularly we can see this through her myth and we can see it also through the cycles and rhythms in women's lives she reflects that transition from mother and mothering and motherhood towards crone towards the elder towards the wisdom and so she reflects the processes of attachment so you think about mothering attachment is necessary for the survival of the child yeah and yet also detachment whether that detachment is for you like you know after two weeks or for other women maybe at other points during their life and their child's life or may for some mothers never move into detachment although life is calling for that some mothers never let go or maybe are, are forced to let go so we can see in these um, rhythms and tides and um, you know the the journey of a lifetime as well as the journey of a day actually that we're called to move between the light and the dark between love and loss the whole time mm -hmm. until we come to that final loss which is of course leaving the body yeah um, and who knows then what takes place yeah so in terms of your experience you know what you've shared you know really demonstrates to me why your offering is called the resilience room so would you like to share more about that? I mean, how do you how do you work with women? My work with whole women is about helping us to understand the light within the darkness, you know, and to help women to embrace and move through those shadows to a new birth, to a new spring, to a new seeding. Mm. So, you know, what do you see around that, around the resilience room and how you're working and your vision? My personal perspective um, changed completely when I saw the adoption as a gift. Because the adoption papers were signed at actually winter solstice. Um, a few years later, at least a dozen years later, I sat thinking, I think, what, what is the ultimate gift? And I realized that I had given, I had gifted my ultimate gift to a new family and I briefly put myself in their shoes at the, the, the complete delight of receiving this, this baby boy. I knew they had a little girl already who was also adopted and that enabled me to move through my grief in a, a much more positive way. Now I don't expect any other woman to see her adoption in the same way that I saw mine. The adoption of my of my baby my son but what i can do is help women to remember without being overcome by an emotional onslaught of loss the loss is there we live with it what we don't have to do is to succumb to it we can remember our babies without reducing us to sobbing wrecks. Yeah. Because we, we, in addition to not being able to nurture our child, if we are constantly in a state of complete grief and anguish, we're not able to nurture ourselves either. And by nurturing ourselves, I feel that we open that door wider energetically to welcome that baby or that child back into our lives in a different way 
and to create just as Persephone comes back, she's changed. She's not the same as when she first went with Hades. She's not the same. She comes back to um, Ceres, to Demeter. Different, but the same. And so for me, the resilience room is supporting women to step into being different, yet the same. Yeah. To support them, to enable them to see the strength within them and the love that they nurture for themselves as well as their baby, even though their baby was taken. And to enable them to understand that they can still nurture that person, even though they're not in touch, even though they might be in touch, they might be estranged, they, it is still possible to nurture that relationship, even if the relationship hasn't yet made physical contact. Mm. And what, what I'm hearing too in what you're describing is, is in the way that I work to embrace the loss and to move through it without getting caught in, in unnecessary suffering. Mm. Because when we, we fully feel the loss, which might mean we become a sobbing wreck for weeks or months or whatever, mm. but when we fully feel it, then the potential is to move through it mm. and to learn to live with it as well mm. as, as we can. Mm. And knowing that that will also have its own rhythm at times it may be just there in the background and other times it may be as raw as the moment it took place. Yeah, but so I can cool. help, them, help them with techniques to support them through those moments. Absolutely. Uh, it's, not, it's not an instant change of of being it it's taken how many decades to reach where we are and um yeah it won't take decades to move forward but it will take weeks no and also you know what i see with it too is a change of perspective from you know that patriarchal view of needing to fix it yes but to allow it because in my experience when i allow that rawness to take me you know, there is, there is an opening to um, much deeper love, much deeper connection, not only to myself, but to everything, you know, everything in my mm. life. So full circle, which is interesting because Persephone comes back to her mother, changed, yeah, mm -hmm. but reconnecting. And I know that you've recently connected with your son and how you know, that brings me such joy that we can speak about this aspect of it. So how, how is that? I know it's fairly recent, isn't it? How yes, it yes, it is. Um, I was, um, I, I haven't closed an old account. And one day while I was waiting to join an online conference, I saw that there was a little red dot. So I thought, oh, for goodness sake, who's selling me something today? And I went in with my password and there was a, a, a message that was quite old. It was over a year old and it began. If you're the person I think you are, this is the most difficult thing I've ever written. And my breath just caught in the back of my throat. And it ended with, if you want to stay distant after all this time, I will understand. No, 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 come here, come to mama. She needs you and you need her. Come on, come home, come home. So I sent, I sent an instant message to back and said, crikey, I've just picked up this message. I am, I hadn't noticed it was there. Um, these, I don't use this account. These are my numbers. It was literally everything, you know, almost including my, you know, passwords, almost. It was just like a download of this is who I am. This is where you'll find me. Um, and I'm really looking forward to hearing from you. And I thought it would take a day or two to hear back. So I came out of the conference and there was a message waiting for me. Um, so within the hour, I had a reply saying, wow, wow, great to hear from you. I need to go and tell my mum. Yeah, that's absolutely fine. And I, I went back and I said, oh yes, definitely. And while, and if, if you see her, please give her a hug from me. I've thought about her a lot over the years. 
And later that evening, I had a message back to say, funny enough, she said exactly the same about you, that she's thought about you a lot over the years. And I thought, that, that is good. That is really, really wonderful because it means that me and another woman who both adore this, this baby that was and is now a fully grown man have been thinking of each other all these years. And we now, I'm not only now in contact with him, I'm also in contact with his mum. And he calls us both mum. Yeah. Um, he says, I've got two mums. I said, so I call you both mum. And it's, it's absolutely wonderful. He's a lot taller than I imagined. Um, but yes, the first time that we had a video conference and thank goodness for video conferencing, um, we had this video chat and I sat here and I looked in, in the video and he smiled and I said, oh, you've got my smile. He said, and your nose and your chin. And it is, it is, I have no words to describe how um, deeply joyous it is to look into the screen and see me reflected back, but from a man. It is, it is as if I've just been gender changed and, and there I am. Just, I think he's about six foot three. So he has come down once. We have met in person once since in the last seven months. Um, we, we contact each other quite regularly. It's not all life changing stuff. It's you know, garden design and what do you know? What do I do here and things like that. But yes, to to actually meet up was it mended my soul. It enabled me to stand in my own light. It enabled me to stand up and say publicly, "I am a mum," and it's taken forty one years to do that. I am a mum. I've always been a mum. I've not been able to say that I was a mum because that meant unearthing and opening up all the pain and hurt. Um, I've moved through that. So now I can actually stand and say, yes, I am a mum. This is my son. And yes, he has another mum. And I am not birth mum and she is not adopted mum. We are just, to him, we are mum. Mm. And, and it is a very respectful, loving relationship between the three of us. It's, it's, it's wonderful. Mm. Thank you so much for sharing that joy. I mean, what a joyous, um, you know, outcome, ending, mm. a full cycle, you know, how amazing, how powerful. And just, you know, reminds me once again that truly anything, 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 anything is possible. Mm. You know, anything is anything is possible in the whole realm of different possible outcomes of that journey of you and and that soul who chose to be born through you, mm. you know, yes just just the, the connection is deep and has always been there mm. um, in the early days he sent me with his mum's permission some photographs of him growing up now when I grew up on a farm. When a calf is taken from its mother after three days, she paces and paces and calls and calls and calls. And this goes on for maybe another week until eventually the loss within her, she just walks away and gets used to the fact that her baby is gone. It's heartbreaking and it happens every day on dairy farms. And I had that knowledge growing up and when my son was, was adopted, when I handed him over to the foster parents, I'd only been there the once with, the, with my social worker. And we, I didn't drop him off, we, we, we took him there and I left him there. And a few weeks later, I was doing the equivalent of a cow pacing up and down and up and down and up and down. And one of my friends, or several of my friends had motorbikes, but one of my friends said to me one day, I said, I, I, re I really, really, really need to know he's okay. And he said, well, do you know where he is? And I said, well, I don't know the address, but I think I can get there. He said, well, come on then. So I got on the back of a motorbike and I went up to the foster parents' house. And I had no idea what I was going to do when I got there. 
I just needed to be near to him. Mm. I needed, it was primal, so deep, I needed to be near to him. So that's what we did. We, we went up there. Um, and when I got there and I got off the motorbike and my friend said, so what are you going to do now? I said, I don't know. He said, do you want to stay? Do you want to go in? And I said, I don't think so. He said, okay, that's all right. So I got back on the bike and we went back home. But I answered my primal call of going to where my son was. And given that I'd never driven that route from where I lived to the foster parents, I got there. Within a day, the social services were on to me because I shouldn't have done that. That wasn't in the agreement. Um, and I said, I, and she said, well, do you want to see your son? And I said, yes, I do. She said, right, okay, I'll come and get you and we'll have an official visit. So I'd had a, a, a set of photographs taken of him as, an, as a very tiny baby, 10 days old. So I took one of these photographs with me to the foster parents when I went there. And I said, this, this is to go to his new family because by the time he gets to them, they won't know what he looked like at 10 days old. So when we first got to, so I handed over that photograph and a couple of the bits and pieces. So fast forward to last November and we were talking about, you know, him as a baby. And he said, well, I've got some, he said, I'll take some photographs from mum's photo albums and send up to you. I said, all right, then, okay. So these photographs came through. One of the first ones was or the photograph that I took. So I know that the foster parents and social services handed it over with him to his birth family, to not his birth family, his adoptive family. Um, so they had that record of him from 10 days old because I, it was important for me that they had that connectivity. He said he's always known he was adopted. He'd always known that my circumstances were very difficult. What I wasn't prepared for was the photographs of him as a three, four, five-year-old. And I sent him a photograph of me as a five-year-old on my first school photograph. And other than I was wearing a dress, the two children were identical. There was no difference between either child in either photograph. One was me, age four. One was him, age four. And we were peas in a pod, as somebody has said. And that I didn't expect, but I'm so grateful for it. I'm so grateful that his mum has happily shared her memories so that I can see the stages that he went through growing up. Mm, how beautiful. Mm. Beautiful. And, and, and honouring your, your primal wisdom of what you needed to do. Yes. Yeah, what you needed to do. No matter what it cost you, actually. Mm. Yeah, profound. Thank you so much, Joy, for sharing with us today. You know, amazing stories that, that really reveal who Ceres is in the living of her. Mm. Uh, energy so you know thank you so much and I really honor your honesty and your vulnerability in sharing because it's really touched me and I have no doubt it will touch other other women too um, and that's that's why I want to reach out to other women who might have experienced similar loss of of their baby not necessarily through miscarriage but through adoption um and to enable them to to work through the shackles that are the the grief and the emptiness and the desolate feelings that mm. come with it mm. thank you thank you so much and i'm just going to complete by reading the last piece from my book The truth of Ceres' journey is that mother love naturally moves towards becoming unconditional. It calls to evolve as our children grow. We see this play in nature. The trees don't hold their leaves in autumn. The buds don't fear to break into flower or to become the seed. Nature is unconditionally flowing. Ceres calling is always to growth through the darkness. Whether that shadow is our own inner world or external circumstances is immaterial really. Ceres gift is in discovering the power to move through the cycle. In moving through it, no matter how forsaken we may seem, 
evolution is known. Love is rediscovered in another form. The capacity to nurture and care finds another landing place. In truth, we are always being challenged with the seeming fact of our own powerlessness in the face of change. Series shows us how we react and hold on in the face of change, yet how we have the potential to respond well to its inevitability. We are powerless to avoid change. Recognising this fact is maturity. Embracing change comes through living its flow. This is series ultimate gift. We are the cycle. Thank you, Joy. My Thank pleasure. You. Absolute pleasure. Mm. Much love. Yes, you too.